But let's talk about the establishment. How do you think the new leader of the opposition is faring so far, our good friend Kimmy Badlock? Oh, well, of course, she's saying all the right things to make the establishment conservatives sort of uh, champing at the bit to, to get going with their new administration. All of the uh, kind of stuff like, oh, uh, multiculturalism has failed in Britain while simultaneously trumpeting her multicultural heritage as a virtue, bringing something of uh, unique value to her leadership and to the party and to the country without being able to name what that is other than a magical kind of blackness. Magical blackness? Oh. <laughs> How do we get that? Is that like white supremacy? Oh, I don't know. It, it's, you know, you ask anyone, I mean, when when her, her victory was announced, the first thing that the announcer said was that, and isn't it great we have our first black woman and Labour can't seem to manage it? And it's like, Okay, fine, but what innate virtue does her melanin confer upon her that makes her a more effective political leader and intellectual? And no one can actually answer that question other than oh, previous experiences that are different. But that doesn't work if you've been raised in Britain as Kemi was since she was 12. And so it's it's this it's this big question mark of why the Conservatives continue to embrace an identity politics framework when they simultaneously are saying that they only see people in terms of merit and that's the country uh, the direction the country should be going in. So Kemi's got lots of strengths. One of the strengths is she's good at debating. She's good at uh, she's forthright. So I've seen her at the dispatch box, and she's quite strong. You know, she said to Keir Starmer, you or David Lammy need to apologise for what he said about President-elect Donald Trump. It's inappropriate for a UK spokesman to be saying those kind of things. And like, she puts it out there, which is great. She's good at rhetoric, which is great. But how do you think she's doing in terms of action, or how do you think she will do in terms of action to follow up that rhetoric? Well, I mean, she's got a history among the people who have worked with her and her constituents of being generally um, lazy and terrible at turning up. Uh, even when she was a part of the cabinet, she would turn up late to meetings and the meeting would be basically over and, and she'd sort of get flustered about the fact that she hadn't been included. And it's like, well, if you'd turned up on time. So I am, I'm concerned that this is, she's very good at the front facing stuff, but not, not the hard work underneath or all elegance on top like a swan, but not much paddling going on underneath, just coasting around. And, um, you know, we have seen some inconsistencies in her, her manner of presenting herself. Now, of course, everyone's allowed to have a journey with regards to their political life and their understanding. I think that needs to be normalised more. And we should, we should, you know, not beat them over the head about them being late to the party too much. No, no. But um, in other instances, um, you know, Kemi built her, her platform on, on her mixed Nigerian uh, heritage. And um, then when it was expedient to embrace her British heritage and talk about how she's flourished despite being an immigrant to this country um, as being a British person. But since she's now got into leadership, this she's re-embracing this narrative of the value of, of her, her Nigerian roots and i don't have an issue with people drawing strength from whatever backgrounds they come from but, but it's this flip-flopping of, of it matters and it doesn't matter i don't like that inconsistency it worries me going forward i don't like how identity politics at all but what i do like is what you said about uh, not bashing people over the head if they're late to the party that's very charitable we need to be more welcoming to people who join the party we need people to become sound and to become based, to use modern terminology. And they, when they do, we need to welcome them. We can't say, oh, you weren't here at that point, you were too late. And because we want everyone to be commonsensical again. And so that's something that we need to be pushing more of, because I've seen quite a lot of this puritanical uh, pushing back against people who want to join in the fight. We need more soldiers in the fight. Um, now, the last topic I want to discuss is one that uh, Keir Starmer has been pushing, because his celebrity friend, Esther Ransom, said that uh, it was important to her and so this is how public policy is being uh, produced at the moment by the, the Labour government. It is, of course, the topic of euthanasia, assisted suicide, assisted killing, whatever they want to call it. 
Um, Kim Ledbetter, the horrible MP who is up in Batley, who hasn't supported the Batley Grammar School teacher, who is still in hiding, by the way, viewers. This is the, the guy that led an RE lesson about free speech and mentioned Mohammed or may have shown a drawing of Mohammed or something and then got castigated and death threats by the jihadis and the Muslims in the school and has been in hiding ever since. Anyway, this kid led better, became the local MP there. She hasn't helped him at all. And this is the woman who is pushing through, she is pushing through uh, a proposal for euthanasia and trying to make sure that it gets through without much of a debate. Have you been following this case, Charlie? In degrees, um, I think Parliament are relatively reconciled upon the point already. I think their concern is not so much arguments amongst themselves, but arguments with the British public. I think the British, British public divide quite harshly into being for and against it. And whilst there are sort of identifiable political camps in that um, those who are Christian will obviously embrace a, a pro-life ethic in, in, in instances of both abortion and euthanasia. Um, those who uh, don't ascribe to any religion tend to not, not have that attitude towards the value of life. They don't see it as, as, as mystical and having a value in, in that way. Um, but those who, but it's muddied by the fact that there are people who are otherwise cautious about, about it. Uh, but who, who agonise over the point because they've had experience with their own sick loved ones or know that they've got, uh, you know, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's on the horizon for themselves and are terrified about what that's going to look and feel like for them and what that's going to do to their family. Um, but you, again, you see, um, at least for myself, what I see in Parliament is those who are advocating loudest for this to happen have the least experience with, um, sick relatives with life and death decisions you know even it'd be helpful just to have people like paramedics you know testify to their their experience of, of having to make life or death decisions upon a scene same with police officers I think there's it does something to a person which complicates the point but my, the concern for me is parliament's uniformity on the point there's very little resistance to this. I was hoping reform would be one of the people putting up resistance, but they have come out saying that they are in fact in favour of the bill. Yeah, I saw Richard Tice using some very emotive language um, about this, uh, which I thought was quite disgraceful. It wasn't, it wasn't very fact-based or reason-based. Um, what I worry about is the slippery slope. We see what's happening in Canada already after just a couple of years of having this euthanasia policy. In that people are, it starts on the extremities. Okay, we must avoid all suffering. No one should ever suffer in their life, which of course is an impossibility. Uh, but if someone is suffering, they should be able to end their life. And then it, it moves quickly to the point of now they have, if teenagers are depressed, they can choose to end their own life. It's absolutely insane that it's, it's, this death cult has been pushed as something normal. Anyway, we can see a tweet here from Miriam Cates saying, Labour's plan to cut NHS waiting lists. Of course, she's being facetious there, but there is something in that. In that the NHS waiting lists are too big. The NHS is spending too much money. It is, you know, a country centered around the NHS. And so when they have cases of people that perhaps are going to cost a lot of money to heal, or perhaps are going to cost a lot of money to keep alive for longer, when you weigh that up against the benefits of, you know, the financial benefits of ending their life earlier, which path are they going to take? Well, we're already seeing some cases of that. We've had many instances already. Uh, Sudeep Shatara Malaysia is one case. Maybe India is another case. We've had many cases where the state has said, no, it's better for you to die than for us to keep you alive any longer. So I worry about this slippery slope. Thank you for watching my Common Sense Crusade. If you'd like to watch the whole show, you can subscribe to lotuseaters.com for as little as £5 per month, and then you get access to a bank of content as well. My show is 3 p.m. every Thursday. See you there. Day fault. Thank you.